This is probably the longest video I have ever made that I consider to be of a good intellectual quality and if you're a vegan, especially if you're a vegan, you should definitely watch it all from the start until the end and see if you're truly as open-minded as the moment you were when you became a vegan because in all chapters and even in the conclusion I make new arguments against veganism that I'm sure you never thought of before and certainly want to check out. Especially if you look up to people such as Cosmic Skeptic and Earthling Ed, among others, or perhaps you're looking for an excuse to eat meat, consider this to be the first serious response towards vegan ideology that contains something other than eat meat good and we humans are superior, though I suppose I'll make the latter argument at some point of the video. Regardless, all parts are important and you can't really say you have watched the video if you have just finished the first 20 minutes, because clearly you'll be missing on a lot. Anyways, enjoy the video. There has been a dramatic increase in the population of people who self-identify as vegans. Although this happened rather quickly, it was nonetheless an objective and predictable historical development due to an increase in harm avoidance and extending the moral circle that had recently happened in our culture. In other words, it is not an independent phenomenon which is adopted based on abstract logic and rational articulation, but rather due to a social development that had preceded it and continues to dominate our society as well as shape our moral outlook on the world. Now, I have thought about veganism for practically since I have first heard it, and every single time it annoyed the hell out of me. But prior to this video, in order to counter veganism in most of my debates and discussions with vegans, I'd usually make points such as, oh well, it's actually expensive and not many people will be able to afford it, and sometimes people forget to take their supplements and we have evolved to be omnivorous without addressing the core morality behind it directly. Honestly, Honestly, looking back at it from the present, I suppose they are semi okay arguments, but comparing them to vegan arguments, they pale in comparison and appear to be much weaker. A vegan will usually respond to me with, oh well, we can take care of that, I'm vegan for more reasons, and I want to minimize unnecessary suffering, and then I would respond with, oh well, these animals are used for food and jobs, so this is not really that unnecessary, without questioning the moral foundation of harm avoidance directly and following that would have lengthy conversations about morals and whether we should continue to sustain this practice and no matter how well I crafted my arguments, I felt like I'd eventually have to concede on some points or be regarded as an evil person because at the end of the day I still support the industry that causes harm to animals for human pleasure as they put it. In all of these conversations, vegans would have a coherent worldview and moral values they base their positions on, and while I had sort of a pragmatic positions regarding this issue, such as it creates jobs, fulfills people's demands, and even evolutionary destiny, as yes, we have evolved to be omnivorous, and then I'll say that countries in Asia and Africa are increasing their supply of meat, so it is a pointless endeavor to try to decrease it in the West, as well as people grow out of being vegans anyways. And on the pragmatic viewpoint, I suppose it's an average argument to make, considering that obviously our food consumption will double by 2050 and most of the growth will be meat, as it's a very nutritious product that would be especially of use in the developing countries such as India, which is killing off its plant-eating habits. Looking at it, I feel like this argument, besides demotivating vegans, does not have any moral value in the abstract sense alone. It sort of even concedes the fact that human harm is being done to animals or even overlooks it. Going to the past and looking at it now, my opposition towards veganism has always been and remains a moral opposition, but due to an unfriendly reigning popular morality, I barely said anything of my actual position towards veganism and had to resort to shitty arguments such as Earthling Ed made before finally becoming a vegan, though obviously misrepresenting them. This year, after dissecting the Darwinian and constructivist literature, as well as watching a 
couple of vegan films in order to understand them better, I have finally crafted a good argument against veganism that I'm proud of to stand behind and defend it as my own. This argument, or should I say two main or three points scattered throughout the video, were never even entertained by those vegans who debunk and in some cases fail to debunk anti-vegan arguments, be they on YouTube, TED Talk or somewhere in the internet. They don't seem to be aware of this argument consciously or even subconsciously. The only two people who got close to formulating it were Edward Dutton in his video titled White Kind of People Become Vegan, which was pretty damn close to my actual argument, but it was never finished and went into virtue signaling argument instead of the one that I will make today. But nonetheless, it was a great video that I recommend everyone to watch. Another person who got pretty damn close to it was GF Gariepi, but unfortunately even he missed it. Perhaps a better way to start this will be to precisely outline what is ethical veganism, which is the type of veganism that I have a problem with, and as it is defined by a leading vegan activist, it is the minimization to the highest extent possible of all animal suffering. Their basic argument can be reduced to harm avoidance and unfortunately in many cases a provision to animals prepared for slaughter with some kind of legal recognition, some sort of a legal right that to to my shame we are already extending to chimpanzees and there is a logic behind it that I will get later into. Although the argument by itself is logical, unfortunately much of it relies on emotions and already existing dominant moral foundations of harm avoidance and equality. You'd often see vegans crafting arguments such as, well, what if it was your dog, or do you think this is humane, or what makes it justified morally, and finally, would you like it to be done to you? while at the same time showing the public the torch of animals for human consumption in an attempt to revoke a sense of compassion from humans. And if you have been very cautious at analyzing their rhetoric and tactics, you'd come to the ultimate conclusion that all of their arguments and tricks rely on two moral foundations, which is harm avoidance and equality, with harm avoidance usually taking precedent, because usually vegans admit that animals are inferior and deserve less compassion than humans in a discussion between Earthling Ed and some middle-aged meat-eater, although of course the vegan got an upper hand at the end of the debate, at the start he could not answer a simple question that I wish the meat-eater had pressed him on, and the question was the following, why one should reduce suffering among animals? And the best Earthling Ed could do is to resort to circular reasoning, and this has been similar to every other interaction I had with vegans, their reasoning turns circular whenever you start questioning their harm avoidance moral foundation directly. It goes something like this. A vegan says, I want to reduce animal suffering as much as possible, and then I reply with, why? What is the rationale behind it? And then the debate opponent just repeats the first premise circularly, assuming I'd accept it. But when I don't and explain that they're engaged in circular reasoning and that they must provide a deeper reason for their belief, they either freak out and call me evil, or if they are clever, which yes sometimes happens, resort to the second moral foundation of equality. And as they see it, animals possess a certain amount of intelligence, have evolved just like we have, and are similar to us in many respects, therefore we should reduce their suffering and oftentimes these people call themselves sentients, they are in a way better philosophically articulated vegans that have been fairly challenging for some to debate. Now, before I proceed in providing a logical and a social argument against veganism, I urge you to visit my Subscribestar and Patreon page and leave me some shekels if you like my content and want me to continue red pilling more people. Any help will be greatly appreciated as I want to replace my part-time job with this. Anyhow, the reason why these people hold those values so closely to heart and are able to influence other people by simply showing them the dominion, after which asking the viewers how can one justify this is pretty simple. We have been under selection for altruism and empathy even before human evolution, and because of mere neurons we are able to see others suffering and we don't like it on the instinctive lizard brain level. 
This is why we are able to detect the emotions of humans so well, but not so well are able to detect the emotions of, let's say, pigs, though pretty often as seen in the movie, when it's an obvious expression of emotion, the people are moved. Though you definitely have less empathy for a pig than for a human, and multiple studies show the same picture, and recently a paper arguing for genetic proximity to be a driver of compassion proved it fairly well. We have a bias in liking those species that are more genetically related to us. This is why most vegans are vegans for animals and complex beings such as dolphins, but less so for fish, and even less so for squirrels and couldn't care less if we killed a bunch of insects and bugs for the simple reason of genetic distance, which made humans not understanding their emotions and will to life, which they undoubtedly express. We have evolved to such a different direction that we couldn't care less for their well-being and partially because we ourselves have evolved to be disgusted by them and see them as dangerous even if they haven't done any harm to us. In other words, what I am getting at right now is this. We have evolved and are indoctrinated to be high in harm avoidance, however, it is not redistributed equally as we are unable to detect the emotions of fish and therefore in some cases couldn't care less how they do. Yet when it comes to pigs getting slaughtered for bacon, we have hysteria. However, when it comes to some humans that are perceived as oppressed, being called a different gender they claim they're not, it's a hate crime. In other words, the threshold for harm is different depending on the species. For fish it's close to non-existent, for chickens it's way below average and for humans it's high. That is to say that we value all animals unequally, no matter what one vegan might say. At one side of the extreme you've got humans, then dogs, cattle, less complex animals, fish and finally more primitive forms of life. Now and if some vegan will tell you that oh no, I value all sentient life equally, he will lie to you and other than to present scientific data of human bias against those genetically less related to us, which I already did, a better example will be the actions of vegan themselves. For example, in 2018, about 70 billion land animals were slaughtered for food, while at the same time anywhere up to 1 trillion to almost 3 trillion of individual fish were killed. Where exactly is the outrage for that? Why don't we focus on things that cause the most amount of harm? The answer is pretty simple, we don't care. And that's because we can't detect their emotions due to a genetic distance. I doubt that the Dominion would have succeeded at an emotional level that it did had it showed the slaughter of fish and bugs. Yet I know vegans might say that it's still bad, but they wouldn't obsess over it as they would about a land animal being tortured, as the suffering of fish and bugs wouldn't possess their being on a daily basis basis because they can detect their suffering. However, the harm inflicted on the fish is objectively way greater than it is inflicted on the land animals. But let's look at the land animals for a moment. Ironically enough, in vegan advertisements and even documentaries, you barely see any chicken being mistreated, with most of the focus going into cows and other complex land animals who again are killed way less than chicken, in the case of cattle by 200 times. And I know what you might say, yes they show it, however, I'll respond with they are under showing it. And that is probably because chicken is more inferior than cattle and subsequently it will be hard for a human to sympathize with chicken with only detectable emotion being when they are dying. If vegans were to be truly concerned about harm, they would likely focus all of their attention on fish and bugs, a little bit more on chicken and barely any attention to complex animals such as cows and etc. Instead, they are doing just the reverse and recently started attacking zoos and in some cases pet animals. What my first point is getting at is that vegans are almost exclusively concerned for those who are more complex, are genetically related and expressing emotions in a way that humans will understand. If we of course were to look at it more objectively, I propose an agent theory. This is not a proposal of how we ought to treat other living beings who are not our species, this is an observation of how we are treating other living beings right now. Consider this, a human is able to possess complex language which allows him to shape his environment according accordingly and understanding of the world, has an 
average IQ of about 90 and finally is able to properly self-reflect on himself and his environment, which leads to a successful civilization creation and maintenance as well as complex logic, art, science and etc. This gives a human a high degree of objective worth, because even one human may design a project which will reshape a certain habitat for billions of fish in accordance to his will. In fact, this is what we do. Now, the most complex animal to us is chimpanzee or bonobo, which along with dolphins are the only animals who are able to recognize themselves in the mirror, which means they possess a small degree of self-awareness that other animals simply lack, and in some cases are able to use environmental items to their advantage, though the largest footprint they have on the environment is misplacing an insect population. They can't even build structures, it seems. Either way, I want you to be aware that my primary argument is not about intelligence per se, though it certainly helps. The primary argument here is the aging theory. The chimpanzees, which are the most complex animals second to us, are not able to influence the environment around them, nor enslave other animals. Although as all animals they are hierarchical and group selective, and to some degree individualistic, they are not capable of producing complex networks based on legal principles and currency. No animal is able to do that and the only way they could influence the environment is when their population explodes or diminishes. In other words, they have barely no objective value of to speak of when it comes to their effects on the environment, because in our world we place value in social connections, intelligence, money and morality that we agree with, and those who we admire the most happen to change their surrounding environment the most. For example, a film director Director, a real estate agent, a successful entrepreneur, an artist or head of government. We look up to those people but we never look up to animals unless we want to test something on them, but then again our relationship towards them would be of a living object. What I'm getting at is that agent is a person who is able to influence the environment in a serious way and agency is measured from minimal change to the environment to maximum change in the environment per capita. And I should stress that agency is distributed unequally among animals, although the most complex animal is probably worth 1,000th of the average human. But if we were to take an economic estimation as an evidence of shaping their environment, given that the baby chicken is about $1 on average, a human spends over $3 million in a matter of 40 years, which is to say that this is their economic worth in respect to environment shaping. So if we were to go by economics, the average human is over 3 million million times more worthy than a baby chicken. Agency is not equal among humans too. For example, a homeless person is a lesser agent than a steel worker, who is a lesser agent than a journalist, who is even lesser agent than the CEO of a major corporation. But sometimes a journalist can be very famous or a steel worker may be the head of the union. So there are some caveats to that of course, and the relationship still remains as it exists also between races. You can have a Thomas Sowell on one hand and on the other you can get this guy or even this guy. Yet, no matter the racial differences, all humans are somewhat genetically similar to each other and are able to consent, in quotation of course, to the social contract and shape their environment accordingly. And this is why I think we should have human rights, but not animal rights, for those animals who are exploited in the animal industry. Because I still think there should be protections against animals that are bred for different purposes, such as being pets or animals who are just wandering in a city. They still should be protected. But in general, animals are still too primitive to do any of the things mentioned above. Therefore, they have less value if we define value by an ability to influence their environment, which I believe is more important than possessing intelligence or believing the right morals, which again, they possess neither. We humans always value those who have achieved something significantly more than ourselves and those lower in the dominance hierarchy. And the only people who are at the dominance hierarchy 
are practically only those ones who have shaped their environment the most. We don't remember a bunch of 140 IQ professors who have produced 50 non-cited articles and lectured for 30 years, yet usually we value people who are powerful, and if you open a history book, you would know that ordinary people are barely mentioned as we place value in those who influence their respected environment the most and ruled over other people, such as the monarch or the aristocrat, the scientist, the writer, the celebrity, the general and the revolutionary, and yes, in some cases, the union organizer. Now, keep in mind, this is in no way an argument against harm avoidance, though for some it may be enough, it's more or less a simple observation of reality that in fact, yes, human compassion is unequally distributed and that primarily vegan ideology is also rooted in supremacy. It is an argument against equality between the species and I think I have demonstrated it pretty well. There is only but one species that is capable of being an agent and some living creatures are objectively better agents than others and our unequal compassion is mostly benefiting those who are more genetically similar to ourselves. But I am yet to address harm avoidance more directly. As we already have established the inherent superiority of humans over animals and the lack of agency among animals as well as their low inherent worth, we have also established an unequal distribution of empathy, yet we have not established what to do with harm. But for now, consider the following. If vegans were logically consistent in applying their philosophy of harm avoidance, they would be concerned for those they spend little time obsessing over, such as fish and even lesser living things who, yes, are able to feel pain. The the reason why they focus their primary attention on cattle and other complex land animals is due to their higher possession of genetic similarity to humans which allows humans to activate their empathy receptors properly. In fact, one might say yes and I will say it, vegans are primarily concerned about their own emotions regarding the harm that humans are causing to land animals and not objective consequences of that harm. As Earthling Ed puts it best, how do we morally justify by doing these things to animals. They really spend a lot of their time on thinking about the reason and why one might justify such a practice as if anything should involve a justification, while their primarily justification against such a practice dumps down to an emotion of harm avoidance, which now has no deeper root to equality as I have already debunked it. Now, it's just the circular reasoning of minimizing suffering for the simple sake of minimizing suffering. and no no, I will not say it's circular reasoning this time, I will try to engage with it even though I'm engaging with a fallacious emotional argument that is circular. To address this argument, I suppose, I will have to refer to a couple of different things. First, I will have to repeat myself and say that yes, this emotion will feel is natural, however, one ought not to base their philosophical view on emotions, but rather on the consequences of one's actions have on the world. For instance, whether we stop or continue to increase our consumption of animal products, these animals will not suddenly become agents. In fact, if we end it, their life on Earth will end as well because there will not be any reason for their continued maintenance. The objective consequences of the harm avoidance moral foundation will have zero impact on the global world, except that it will slow down global warming. And if you are a vegan for that reason that you are concerned about climate change, perhaps you can use this argument to your own advantage and you would be right. However, I, on the other hand, am happy that the global temperature will slightly increase a couple of degrees because I am of a Russian descent and it will allow Russia to collect money from the trade between Asia and Europe and it will be passing through the Arctic Ocean instead of the Suez Canal, as well as to export more gas to Europe as they will be transferring to green energy, killing off their own industrial potential and finally the transformation 
population of Siberia into an environment suitable for agriculture and human expansion. But I understand that there are people who are not too happy about global warming and I am not too happy about it when it goes after 3 degrees and yes they may adopt veganism for the sake of reducing human footprint but then they will not be ethical vegans but rather vegans for an entirely different reason and so I'm less concerned about them as my argument primarily relies on moral or ethical vegans. But anyways, the impact that animals used in agriculture have right now is huge and consequently one might argue that it is the purpose of animals used in agriculture to be exploited and consumed on a massive scale because logically there is no other purpose for them other than that. Maybe you can think of another purpose but I couldn't come up with any as I'm not superstitious and I don't believe they have an inherent value in themselves. Releasing them on the other hand will only lead to their extinction because as a result of eugenics they are not adapted to live in the wild. Moreover, the harm caused to them itself cannot really be measured objectively and frankly for practical purposes exists only as an emotion in the minds of humans. In other words, and as ironically as it may be, the only actions by agents that came about as a result of animal suffering are some humans who use this information about animal harm in a way to reduce it, failing to realize that a reduction of harm will accomplish nothing besides some humans feeling more emotionally satisfied and a ton of negative consequences that I'll talk about in the third part of the video and yeah it will reduce emissions in the western countries I wanna emphasize that I don't deny that. But notice how I was appealing to consequences and logic throughout this video while the vegan position is primarily and almost fully emotional and consequently I'll have to address the emotions too even though I really don't have to but understanding that some vegans are not able to comprehend that the emotions of animals bred for consumption are unworthy and inferior to the emotions of humans I'll have to address the suffering of animals bred for consumption directly and not some human perception of their suffering which it ultimately is. Now as I have already mentioned animals bred for consumption are significantly less worthy than humans with a ratio of perhaps one to a half a million on average. It doesn't mean they don't experience pain. Now I'd say that it doesn't even matter that they experience pain as they are not agents and consequently we must not worry about their actions or responses aside of course from acting on their purpose that is to be bred for consumption but let's say that I never said it or it didn't convince you or you think I'm a psychopath and therefore you should disregard anything that I've said by the way I'm not a psychopath. In that case I'll resort to another argument concerning their subjective pain. Now it's no secret that animals experience pain while they are slaughtered for consumption and also while they're living in human created conditions before finally getting slaughtered. In light of that, I want you to think about another question. How unequally distributed this pain is between different animal species and the environmental conditions in which they are selected for. And I claim that an animal raised among humans and on a farm feels less pain than an animal raised in the wild. Pretty strange claim, isn't it? And I bet you automatically thought about different medications animals are given throughout their lifetime and special painkillers or sleeping pills they swallow before getting slaughtered. Not at all, though they definitely help in reducing the pain. The answer lies in selective breeding. Now, it is no secret that animals that are bred for human consumption have lesser brain than their wild counterparts. And as we know, brain size correlates with intelligence by about 0.3 to 0.4 among humans, but less people know that the same is true with animals. But keep that for future. For now, I'll give you an example that a domesticated cow's brain is more than a quarter smaller than the brain of her ancestor. There is a consistent casual relationship between a brain size and intelligence with instinct species, no matter whether one measured a dog, a mice or a human. The longer you breed animals and keep them in low G demanding environments, the lesser will be the selection for intelligence. What we are doing to them is we are essentially turning their long life history into a fast life history. Now what I said for the most part involves intelligence which is an argument against sentience, but it's not an argument against pain and suffering one might say. Well true, however pain is very hard to measure directly and there have been barely any studies on data 
aside from mice, but we know that smaller brain size will have behavioral consequences, and we also know that selection highly reduces fear of humans among all animals with a few generations of breeding and even more so with more generations of breeding among all tested animals. Similarly, as the vegan documentary The Dominion gladly informs us, about half of fish raised in farms are deaf as a result of accelerated growth rates deforming their sound receptors. Moreover, and I quote, the cute puppies sold for thousands of dollars often suffer from diseases or other health conditions or behavioral difficulties as a result of the conditions they were exposed to in the farm and generations of selective breeding. In other words, we are breeding them for consumption and consequently intellect as well as human fear are declining because they are not needed. And although there is no evidence either way, one would assume they also are under selection for a lower pain avoidance as they are often exposed to it, so why wouldn't they evolve to take it easy? The evolution works in a way that would increase the rates of adaptation to any given environment and fostering reproduction and consequently I attribute fish becoming deaf as an adaptive mutation to make them better suit for the environment as being deaf would likely ease their suffering which is what you would expect to arise in that kind of an environment because it will make them more adapted to it. Similarly, a cognitive decline is a natural mutation that results due to being held in captivity as well as not having an opportunity to hunt and gather food by themselves and instead rely on humans for it, while themselves being engaged in low cognitively stimulating endeavors such as cheating under themselves and fighting against nearby animals. So why not expect a rise in mutations that would allow them to cope better with such a harsh environment? Finally, we're not even directly selecting them for lower pain sensitivity. This is just a likely side effect. We select them for obedience and consumption output. For example, to quote the Dominion again, due to decades of genetic manipulation and selective breeding, they lay an egg almost every day for a total of up to 330 per year compared to the 10 to 15 that a wild hen would lay. In addition to that, in 1957, a chicken after 56 days of living weighed 905 grams while in 2005 after 56 days of living weighed more than 4 kilograms. Now you might say that it's a form of abuse and perhaps it might be, however the longer we keep this on, the higher will be the cognitive, emotional and therefore pain sensitivity decline of the animals that are under selection to be adapted to live under this kind of environment and eventually we'll reach a point in time where there will be no signs of agency amongst those animals who will mutate to such a degree that perhaps one might reclassify them as a separate form of life that feels no pain and has no thoughts. However, we might as well directly select them for a reduction in suffering instead of waiting like a thousand years when regular eugenic practices will likely achieve it eventually. Believe it or not, but there are actual ways of doing that directly. First, we have to clearly identify what is suffering, and the closest we got there is fear and intelligence, which is proven to decrease when animals are around humans and are bred in low G demanding environments. However, it has been shown that at least among mice, there is a specific gene whose loss leads to, and I quote, a complete loss of acute pain perception without any side effects to movement. In other words, cutting the throat of a pig wide open, given we find a similar gene or genes like that in a pig and removing them will transform into a humane form of death with no suffering involved. CRISP can also be used in humans by alleviating chronic pain and frankly I don't see a reason for it not to be used on plant animals bred for consumption. However, as everything new it takes time and probably only decades later such a thing will be used on an industrial scale. As first we need to wait until CRISP becomes affordable for agriculture companies to use it. But this in addition to increasing selection that may even directly involve pain reduction will essentially achieve what vegans wanted all along without actually achieving it if that makes any sense. Also, we now know how to grow lab made meat that will eventually be of a higher quality than regular meat that is now decreasing in quality due to the soy we feed our beef. However, I suspect that it will be a long road until inevitably this industry will take over 
over the existing industry and honestly I wish more luck to it because it will have no emissions and yes no suffering involved. Guzzling cars are being replaced with environmentally friendly ones and so eventually old ways of meat production will be replaced with new ways of meat production. It is a question of time when it will happen but it will. I mean unless of course leftists would start to claim that it's actually disproven pseudoscience and forced to shut it down so you never know. Throughout this video essay, I have often been rather dismissive of harm avoidance and equality moral foundations and of course there is a big reason for it. I did hint in the beginning of the video that veganism is an objective modern development which had resulted from a social shift towards equalizing harm avoidance values. It so happens to be rather usual that the proponents of veganism defend their vegan views by appealing to civil rights, racial slavery, establishment of democracy, women emancipation and now even gay marriage, claiming that veganism is simply a continuation of that behavior while at the same time dissing group biased behaviors as well as hierarchical thinking that are supposedly now a thing of the past and remain an endeavor of the uneducated. I'm not at all surprised that they are saying that given that just 4% of conservatives are vegans or vegetarians while there are 4 times as many liberals who are either vegans or vegetarians. In the paper titled Ideological Differences in the Expense of the Moral Circle, leftists allocate their moral resources away from their kin and towards things that don't really matter, such as all animals in the universe, including alien life forms. Does it sound familiar? This is why arguments for veganism are de facto arguments for leftism as they operate on the same moral foundations and valuing of the outgroup, even animals as we now learn. Moreover, modern veganism could probably not have happened without the normalization of the human equality ideas that are now hegemonic in the West. It only makes perfect sense that now they argue it is time we extend social rights and care for being significantly more inferior and primitive than ourselves. In fact, Peter Singer calls this phenomenon an extending of the moral circle. Essentially, when society starts valuing and thinking about the interests of living things that are not genetically distant to the in-group. Now, of course, the author thought that it's a great idea to expand our altruistic tendencies towards outgroups, even saying that it was moral, but that question aside for a moment, it is certainly not adaptive nor beneficial. And here's why. It has been established in social science literature that those valuing strong group cooperation and care less for equality and harm avoidance consistently demonstrate higher mental health ratings, either be it on the racial level, social levels or as we now know species levels. The mechanism is pretty simple, by extending your in-group's phenotype you automatically extend your own as we have evolved to live among small groups and those genetically similar to ourselves. This is why for example there is a point four relationship between national pride and subjective well-being in a sample of over 40,000 Europeans, with the strongest result being of course for nationalists. Similarly, a study from Scotland has predicted that identification with family and friends and etc had a bi-relational relationship with well-being. Then a giant meta-analysis found a negative relationship between group identification and depression. How surprising! Similarly, the friends we pick are extremely genetically similar to ourselves than one would expect from a random chance to a point of them being fourth cousins. And no matter how absurd it may sound to a person who is not familiar with this, it now has been confirmed by GWAS that we extend the genotype of those similar to ourselves genetically. And yes, that's adaptive and the reverse is maladaptive. This is why you see many leftists and primarily white leftists suffer from mental health problems at the rate that they do. They think a lot about minorities yet barely have a positive white identity and prefer not to acknowledge race even exists, though only when it comes to their own and they consequently suffer from it and so might even probably say and rightly so. 
A similarly remarkable finding is present among vegans, and as you would expect, they are about as mentally ill as are leftists, and you'd be right, and no wonder, given their morality is identical, so what do you expect? Though I must also emphasize the staunch relationship between veganism and eating disorders that I didn't know existed before doing this research, but the relationship is even higher than the relationship between veganism and mental illnesses, which ranges to 25 to up to 400%, with of course most rigorous studies reporting a higher relationship. But finding that about half of patients with anorexia were vegans at some point of their life should alarm more people. Now, a vegan might say, hey, I could be still highly in-group oriented while still being a vegan and so my mental health would not deteriorate. Well, not quite so. As long as you are worrying about animal torture and inequality, your mental health would be lower than the average population, as thoughts about inequality tend to worsen mental health and increase the prevalence of mental disorders, especially when it is concerning the status and the relationship of that is rather strong. Now, don't think you need a citation for worrying and anxiety increasing mental health problems. But a vegan might respond with, hey, we don't know the casual relationship between veganism and mental illnesses. Well, to an extent that's true. There have been few longitudinal data gathered on this topic, but from the info that we have, a conclusion such that mental disorders and veganism are core morbid and that typically a decrease in mental health is followed by becoming vegan is enough to prove my point, because before becoming vegan, people become depressed over the mistreatment of animals, which would stimulate their decision of adopting a vegan diet. But if you are interested about causation and not satisfied with what I have, perhaps Perhaps it would be interesting to consult vegans themselves, and yep, they are basically saying what is already obvious. Veganism makes people depressed because people get anxiety from being exposed to animal suffering and perhaps even feel a sense of guilt. Here are two comments that I'll read out for you. I am depressed because of the amount of suffering in the world, lol. That's why I am a vegan. Here's another one. My mental health improved when I went vegan, until I decided to further educate myself on what goes in slaughterhouses, dairy farms and the egg industry. Ever since then, I cannot get animal suffering out of my head, and that alone is the cause of my depression and anxiety now. The coronavirus pales in comparison to animal cruelty when it comes to what causes my anxiety. Now, given the amount of likes these two comments have received and their approval by the vegan author of the video, they are likely proud of it, and it only further advances my subversive point, which is that veganism can be viewed as an expression of a social disorder. But in any event, the casual mechanism is irrelevant here, as long as the relationship is proven to be bicasual, that is, if both factors become dependent on each other as opposed to one being independent and the other one being dependent, my point is proven. But you might say, so what if vegans are twice more likely to take medication for mental illnesses, so what that they are three times more likely to consider suicide, so what that they have significantly higher rates of mental health issues according to this meta-analysis with over 160k total participants. What difference does it make? Well, I suppose if you are a part of the neurodivergent movement, it makes absolutely no difference, as all mental illnesses are valid and its bad effects are a result of socialization and stigma, but if you live in the real world, you would know that there are large behavioral consequences. For example, the cost from mental disorders on the global economy is around 8.5 fucking trillion US dollars in 2010, assuming all mentally ill could afford their medications. To put that into the perspective, the world's GDP in 2010 was about 66 trillion. In other words, was there no mental illnesses in the world, the GDP for 2010 might likely be around 85 trillion, which is roughly 19 trillion more. Now, that's assuming that the prevalence of mental disorders is one of the general population. Now, to make it even more clear, let's look at the more practical example, taking the average spending and not ideal spending. Approximately 6.5% of US workers experienced a syndrome of major depression last year, which costed around $210 billion for the US economy. Now, knowing how it is for vegans that for every mental illness a normal person has, a vegan has twice the 
size of that on average, you multiply this number by 2. Which is to say that if those steel workers become vegans en masse, now about 13% of US workers would experience major depression and consequently the cost of that would be around 420 billion US dollars for the economy and the data is from 2010, so if it were to occur now, expect a cost of around 800 billion. In other words, there is a clear economic cost for having a population that is vegan. It's not a burden as they still bring more profit than loss, but they bring less profit than people who are healthy and I haven't even looked at the job market and how many jobs would be gone as a result of this transition. But now let's talk about the social consequences of veganism aside from the economy. There are two that I could think of, first is that it would further advance leftist morality and we as a society will become less tolerant towards things that are subjectively perceived to be harmful and will produce more social policy that would operate from an assumption that we should strive towards group equality and reduction in harm, even though at least half of it is not bared by by the data. For example, a logical continuation of harm avoidance morality would also lead to criminalizing all depictions of violence, expressions of disapproval and critique of the current moral system and a reduction in punishment to actual criminals focusing more on rehabilitation and turning a prison into a solitary confined vocation. Or even its total abolition. Similar rhetoric right now is driving the defund the police movement and similar rhetoric is driving restrictions against free speech as well as the culture of mental illnesses that is proven now to be a crisis in our universities. Finally, accepting veganism will also lead one to be striving for equalizing values, which will lead to a lesser tolerance of group inequalities, a rejection for biological explanation of group inequalities, and a lesser tolerance of a just hierarchy as well as normalizing attitudes towards foreigners and a collapse of individualistic culture. These attitudes, for example, right now are leading the open borders discussion, banning group and eugenic research, socialism, and of course moral relativism and an idea that cultures are somehow equal. All these developments, if allowed to take root, will bring a tremendous amount of social disharmony and veganism is another example of that. And the people who are now vegan after accomplishing their degenerate task will focus on something else and direct their mental illnesses and pathological moral foundations towards a hierarchical structure they wish to destroy next simply because it's built on different moral foundations such as meritocracy, purity and tradition. The reason why you never even heard this argument expressed before is due to the fact that we're all tied within leftist discourse informed by the dominant hegemonic morality of equality and harm avoidance that you're not allowed to question. It honestly doesn't make any practical sense for one to be a vegan other than perhaps slow down climate change in the West until the global south quadruples their meat consumption, there is no actual argument among vegans other than animal cruelty and exploitation bad, which again could be solved by furthering eugenics and genetic engineering. The only effect veganism seems to have is the effect of a social disease that people catch and become absorbed by it, consequently worsening the environment around them. Because I'm sick to repeat this, but there are no actual bad so social consequences that come from animals in meat factories being exploited until a human sees it, because yes, only humans are agents and are capable of actually doing something. Now, in part 3, I did say that I'll answer the question of whether it's moral or immoral to exploit and slaughter a farm animal or not. The answer is that it's not moral or immoral, it's amoral, meaning morality is not attached to it at all, and let me explain why. First, violence, exploitation and death are a natural occurrence, no matter what the spiritual descendants of Rousseau will tell you. It is natural among humans and among animals. It is a part of life just like sleep and courtship. Whenever a war occurs between humans, the talks of human rights are swiftly replaced with tough group selection as in the war between chimps. Similarly, just as some animals oppress others, we may oppress other animals. In times of war, those who committed the most 
most amount of killings, receive a large admiration and rewards among their group, and one may even think that it's moral. However, the killing that is directed towards civilians, and I hope we can all agree that it's immoral. But in any event, we oppress almost all animals and do so effectively, and on an infinitely larger scale, unlike any of our competitors, because yes, we are on the top of the food chain. Well, I know you've heard that one before, but I'm sorry, I just happen to think that it's a good argument, especially given the context of this video. Second, animals that are bred for food consumption are bred specifically for that purpose, and by improving the well-being of these animals, we don't benefit from it at all. However, by extending the well-being of animals we take care of and spend our time with, such as our dogs or cats, there is a benefit that we receive, such as lower scores on anxiety and depression as a result, which makes this relationship mutual, that is both parties benefiting from it, and especially we do. So it is immoral to torture your dog that loves you, but it's not moral or immoral to do the same for a pig, or even a dog for that matter that is bred for slaughter, as its relationship is not mutual to you, and perhaps one might say that its purpose is being fulfilled when it's consumed for meat. But overall, I wouldn't even put the question of morality into it, as moral thinking is for humans and not for animals who are not capable of moral theorizing. But in every debate with vegans, one inevitably finds oneself in the position of moral equivalence between animals and humans. For some reason, they like to compare animal exploitation to the Holocaust and bring up human examples without properly seeing a difference between animals and humans, and hence they make this logical mistake that is a consequence of their maladaptive moral foundation. The fact that they can't tell a difference between the two is their problem, but ask yourself this if you are vegan. What benefit will there be to humans given we stop animal exploitation? And aside from slowing down climate change, I don't think there is any benefit, but there are tremendous costs. For the remaining time, veganism remains an exercise of virtuous moral signaling without any real-world implications on behalf of animals, but a ton of negative ones on the subjective well-being of those humans who are engaged in moral signaling. As of now, I view veganism as an expression of social illness that could only be stopped by a swift shift in our cultural values away from harm avoidance and equality, or just ignoring the plight of animals, which is less preferable but likely what the converted vegans will engage in as moral values are about 0.5 heritable. In either way, if you are a reformed vegan that is no longer vegan, which is 84% of the population who once are now considering themselves vegan, because of course veganism as all unhealthy identities is unstable and neurotic, you should redirect your energy towards those in your group and who are able to influence your own life and well-being as well as the social well-being of society as a whole whole, and I'll give you a hint, that is people who are not on the left and are not outgroup oriented. Because at the end of the day, empathy is there for a reason, so use it wisely, don't allow yourself to be manipulated and direct your empathy into something that has no effects or benefits, as animals won't be thankful to you and will just die off. In fact, as Earthling Ted likes to say, they are confused when they're being killed. But if you're still too concerned about the harm that animals receive, and I haven't convinced you otherwise, I'll let you know that it's decreasing per capita, yet increasing in absolute numbers and will continue too, until eventually it is replaced with lab-grown meat whenever it will be cheaper than regular meat, or if we get serious about eugenics and genetic engineering, as I've mentioned before, we could breed living objects incapable of agency and feeling pain, or just incapable of feeling pain if the first part scares you, though we are still going in that direction, so I don't know. But in any event, all the developments that I've just mentioned are a matter of time and will, and most of your vegan aspiration will be achieved anyways without compromising on meat and without you turning neurotic. So just wait for a bit and don't cause any social problems. That is my ultimate advice to any vegans that remain vegans after watching my video.